Amen. Lord, we declare today that we are focusing on your character, your power, your provision. You are the mountain mover. Amen. You are the one who determines the parameters of the seas and says you will not go any further. You are healer. You are restorer. You are the lover of our souls, and you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, it's good to see everybody. Yeah, we can clap about that. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Those of you joining us online, it's good to see you too. I can't see you. You can see me. So uh, get comfortable. Do whatever you need to do. Glad to see everybody. How are we doing? Great. Good. All right. We got somebody that's excited. Amen. Amen. Because I need somebody to run an aisle later today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know if I'm kidding. Hey, I just want to say, if, if you're a guest here, if you're a first-time visitor here to Bridge Church, I just want to extend a special thanks. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us, because I'm going to let you in on something. It's not a secret, or it's not a mystery, or it's not a surprise to God that you're here. And we want to care for you. We want to appreciate you. We want to make sure that you know that you're seen and heard and appreciated because we have understood from what God says about us that we are seen and heard and appreciated. Amen. So thank you for, for being here. For those who come on a regular basis, hey, it's good to see you too. Can you put your hands together for those who decided they were going to be here for the first time? Yeah. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. And next Sunday, next Sunday, I didn't get enough sleep last night, so I'm just going to let you know. We're going to have fun today, all right? All right? It's going to be fun. Um, I sounded like Al Roker from today's show. Anyway, um, next Sunday, back to church Sunday. What does that mean? Well, for those of you watching online, you may have been waiting. You're like, when, is the, like, when, like, when am I going to make my return? Like, when is that supposed to happen? Uh, how about next week? Like, next week. Come and be here in person. We understand that there are still some for various and sundry reasons that you can't or won't, and we understand that. And even though you're apart from us, you're always a part of us. And so continue to engage with us online. Now, to everybody else in the room, and you're like, come back. I've already been here. Well, good. Guess what? Bring somebody else with you. All right? I want to let you in on a little secret. 80% of people that don't go to church, who you would invite to come to church, are favorable to say yes because you invited them. Lots of them want to come, but the thought of showing up to this campus and then navigating where to go or what to do feels a little overwhelming. But if you extend that invitation to them and say, hey, we're having like back to church Sunday after some of the restrictions have lifted, plus out on the plaza, we're going to be grilling up some dogs and there's free food. I mean, who doesn't like free food? Right, right, right here. Yeah, right. And so extend that invitation. You may have been thinking and wondering, you're like, when's the right time? Next week is the right time. Okay. So back to church, see y'all next Sunday, all y'all with your friends, okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we can come together and we can open your word, that we can hear from you. Holy Spirit, we know that you are present here among us, with us. I just pray that you would move in us, that you would encourage us, you would challenge us, you would comfort us. That you would transform us more and more into the image of Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that it would be impossible for us to leave this place unchanged. That we would be different because of what your word says to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm just curious. By a show of hands, we're going to participate here, okay? By a show of hands, anybody else doing any like abnormal reflecting over the past couple years? Anybody? If you got social media, if your Instagram account and your Facebook has been reminding you of what was going on two years ago, right? You know, it was that time we were like, hey, we're going to take two weeks and flatten the curve. And two years later, it was still going on. And it caused me to like do some reflecting about like the uniqueness of what, of what was going on. And there were things that we were engaged with and that we had to consider and we talked about that, that we never thought in a million years that we would talk about. Honestly, as a pastor of a church, I did not have a class in seminary 
in which we discussed what are you going to do when a global pandemic hits and your church has to close? And if that had come up in a seminary class, we would all have been like, bah, it's never going to happen. It's, it's never going to happen. Why even discuss it? I guarantee you, uh, people are talking about it now, how we respond to that. And then there were questions about, you know, like, how long do we stay open and when do we close? And then how long do we stay closed? And then are we going to open and what's going to happen there? And, and we all got introduced to words that now have become a part of our vocabulary that we never thought about before. Like quarantine before 2020 was a movie with Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> and then and all of a sudden it was like a thing that we were experiencing because then you got close to somebody and you got quarantined and and those days changed and we had thoughts about it. And then like social distancing. I never even said that. All the introverts though in the world were like, yes, we love social distancing. We've been doing this forever. And you're going to continue to do it. You're going to remind people, oh, social distance. And I'm going to quarantine after this conversation. So we picked up like four letter words, like Zoom, right? I didn't even, I mean, I knew it was out there and then we were all using it because that was the only way that we could communicate with each other. And then we loved it and then we hated it and we all had like feelings and thoughts. And, and then all of a sudden, like it, it was this compressed time in, in which there was like a veneer or maybe a membrane that was just holding in all these convictions and assumptions and perspectives that we all had. And it just expedited it rolling back and us expressing it because we all had an opinion about everything. We all had an opinion about masks, to mask or not to mask. We all had opinions about vaccinations what it'll do, what it won't do. Like all of a sudden, everybody really started coming forward with what they thought just about everything. And, and then in this hyper compressed season of personal opinion, we had other things come back to the surface of which had always been there as the reality that as a nation, we haven't seen racial equity get as far down the line as we had thought or hoped. And everybody had a thought and opinion about that. And then after 45 years on this planet, I had never seen the degree of political tension that came to the surface. Everybody had an opinion about that, whether it was good. And, and then all, all of a sudden last year, we, we are just a little more than a year away from when we had a siege on our capital. My family and I were flying back from the East Coast and we landed in Phoenix, Arizona. And the time that we had left Charlotte, by the time we had landed in Phoenix, we got into the concourse and my oldest son is looking up at the TV going, Dad, there's people like in the Capitol. I'm like, no, there's not. And I looked and I go, yes, they are. And what happened in the midst of these past couple years is a new form of tribalism started to develop. We all started picking sides based on what we thought or what we believed of who was in or who was out, who agreed or who disagreed. Well, in our opinions, who was right and who was wrong. And all of a sudden, there had always been a sense of division, but it got expedited so much. And I believe that so much of the division that we have experienced is because of this. And this is the point that I want us to remember throughout this message is we struggle to see people for who they are, not just what they do or say. We have a really hard time being able to see through the actions or the words of an individual and understand that behind an action or behind a word is a person, a person with a background, a person with a history, a person with experiences that has resulted to who they are and what they say and what they do right now. But as we continue on in this series, the people that Jesus loved, that's not how Jesus loved people. Jesus didn't just love people based on them saying the right things and doing the right things. As we're going to see today, so if you have a Bible or a device, I want to go ahead and invite you. New Testament, we're in the New Testament, we're in the book of Luke chapter 23. Go ahead and find your way to Luke chapter 23, and then I'll give you the specific address here in a second, but a little background first. If you remember last week, we were looking at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry and the things that subsequently happened. 
Well, now we're fast forwarding to the end of Jesus's ministry, moments before his death. And in the midst of this, we see one of the most radical expressions and examples of how he loved people. But in the time in which we find him, and we'll get there in a second, Jesus has entered into the city and he has gone from being celebrated to being crucified. I mean, even the people at the time, those who wanted to celebrate him now are at a place where they would rather a known murderer and criminal be released than an innocent man be set free. They chose Barabbas. A known murderer. And what do they charge Jesus with? Blasphemy. What is the charge of blasphemy? Is that Jesus was claiming to be God and we know that he is. But they said that is punishable by death. Therefore the sentence crucifixion. And it's in that setting, it's that climate that we find our passage this morning. So jump down to verse 32 with me. It says two others criminals, it's very clear, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right, one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, listen to these words, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. That's in reference to the statement next. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Look at where Jesus is right now. The excruciating reality of crucifixion being nailed fully conscious to a tree Lifted up to die slowly, not just within a few hours, but in cases historically documented over the course of multiple days. Not because of loss of blood, but because of asphyxiation. Literally suffocating to death because you couldn't keep your body up as your lungs filled with water and you died a slow, excruciating death. We see the very beginning of that happening. And Jesus then saying, Father... Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. See, Jesus was able in this situation to even love the numberless and the nameless. Who's he speaking about? The Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers who have nailed him to this cross. Roman soldiers that we don't know what their names are. We don't know how old they are. We don't know anything really about them. We do know that they were a death squad. We do know that this was part of their job description. This is something that they did. We do know that in their mind, they were probably doing the right thing because according to Roman decree, anybody who did anything against Roman law was against the empire. So if you're not for the empire, you're against the empire. Men who have become experts in being calloused for the ability to nail a human being alive to a tree and watch them die and then be so callous to to gamble for the clothes that they had removed from them. And it's in that setting we have the maker of heaven and earth. We have our Jesus looking down and saying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus teaches us and demonstrates for us an astounding degree of empathy and compassion. He's saying what he desires for them beyond what they have said and what they've done. He is showing us something in this and about him and the way in which we can love people that is absolutely astounding, hard enough for us to love people who are lovable, right? And here Jesus is being actively executed and demonstrating mercy. And and in this little moment, we see something that's beautiful that we've got to understand about the work of Jesus, that Jesus loves us in spite of what we've done. I think sometimes we have to realize that. I think sometimes we begin to buy the lie that Jesus only loves us based on what we are capable of doing. That Jesus only loves us based on the sum total of our collective good actions. That Jesus could never love me because of the things that I have done. 
Oh, if, if Jesus only know the things that I've said, the wounds that I've inflicted, the hurt that I have incurred in other people's lives. But we, real, but we realize in this very instance, in this situation, that Jesus is able to love us in spite of ourselves. And in the midst of this, we see a couple different things that Jesus demonstrates for us. And the first one is this. Write this down. There's no slide for this. That Jesus is our intercessor. Math, uh, Hebrews chapter 7 says that he lives always to make intercession. And you might go, like, what exactly does that mean? What does that look like for us? And what that means is to meet and talk with. So listen to this, this visual, to make intercession, to meet and talk with. What that means is Jesus forever lives to meet and talk with the Father on our behalf. That there is no person, there is no pastor, there is no priest that can go and intercede to go and meet with the Father on our behalf than Jesus. Amen? Amen. There is no saint, there is no family member with that big old Bible that knows all the things. They can't even do what only Jesus is able to do. There is one that stands between us and the Father, and his name is Jesus, always living to make intercession because we have an enemy, the father of lies, who's always lobbying against him, saying the things that we've done, and Jesus goes, no, this one is with me. I intercede on their behalf. I have done for them what they could never do themselves. Therefore, I stand between the Father and and them to make intercession. He does that for us. Now, of course, we can go to the Father and pray on behalf of other people, right? Yeah, sure, that's what the Bible says. We're encouraged to do that. I hope people are praying to God on my behalf. Amen? But there's something that's significant about the degree of intercession in which Jesus is making here. And it's he lives, makes intercession, and to offer forgiveness. Only Jesus can forgive. Only Jesus can stand before the Father and say, I took on myself what they deserve to in inflict upon themselves, what, what, what was due them, what should have happened to them, I stood in that place for them, and I gave them my perfect life. Only Jesus is able to forgive, and there's something in this that we can never forget. And I'm just telling you, after being a pastor for 20 some odd years, here's something I need to go back to at times and sit in just the rainfall of God's grace and remember, and it's this, here it is, there's nothing that we can do to outdo the love of Jesus, and there's nothing we can do to undo the love of Jesus. Oh, if you're looking for a tattoo idea, go for it. <laughs> if you're under 18, speak to your parents first. Did you, did you hear that? Like This is something so important for, for us to understand. Because our feelings, our heart, our emotions, our minds will take us in places that are contrary to the truth of the scripture and what it has to say. And the reality is there's nothing that you can do to outdo God's love. I think some of us live like we're tiptoeing around God's approval, thinking that it's contingent on how good you are from day to day. That's not what the Bible says. God's approval of you is based on the full and completed action of another, and his name is Jesus. So on your worst day, he loves you, and on your best day, he loves you. You know why? Because it's not about you. It's about the finished work of Jesus. There's nothing that we can then, listen to this. So if there was nothing that we could do to deserve it, why would we think there's anything we can do to undo it? Oh, pastor, you don't know. Like I've done, some, I've done some bad things even as I came to faith in Jesus. Okay, well, last time I checked that we are saved by grace through faith. That is something given to us that we can't earn or deserve. And so if we couldn't earn or deserve it to get it, why do we think there's something we could do to undo it? I mean, come on. Where's my, where's my former Pentecostal friend? Somebody should have jumped up and like shot across the room. How arrogant are we to think that there's something we can undo that only God himself could do? Do you speak creation into existence? Somebody in here is like, well, I do think highly of myself. I am pretty accomplished. No. Did you give the seas the boundaries by which they could and could not go? 
Have you, have you named the continents? Have you known the faces and names of everyone who would be created because they are created in your image? No, that's not you. Therefore, we are given something that we did not deserve, and how dare we think there's something we could do to undo it. So what do we do? We enjoy it. We appreciate it. We, we, we realize that God has lavished his love and his grace on us. But there is a response. If we've been so saturated in the grace and the kindness and the compassion of God, like what should be the byproduct in our lives? Because I'm just telling you this. Peter tells us that we are weird people, aliens and strangers. Hey, Christians, you're weird. And that's okay. And specifically, some of y'all that I've sat down with, like, you're weird. You know what I mean by that? But we're weird. And this is what Paul says then in Ephesians chapter 4. If we understand the gravity of what has happened to us, there should be a byproduct of it in our lives towards other people. And this is what he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Just as God also forgave you in Christ. Here it is. We show kindness and compassion and forgiveness because, say because, because, let's do it again, because Christ showed it to us. That's what's great. If we fully understand the degree of kindness and compassion and forgiveness that we have received, we will be able to show it to other people. And you know what that's going to show to them? Something that's astounding. Something that's mind-blowing. But I deserve for you to judge me. Well, yeah, but according to what I understand about my Jesus, he was able to see me beyond what I said and did to see the person that he loved and redeemed. That's why I can love you. You're going to melt people's faces doing that. That's why we're weird. That's why we're aliens and strangers is because we live by the rules of another that demonstrated them towards us. Therefore, we can demonstrate them towards other people. Kindness and compassion that's otherworldly. It's simply what Jesus demonstrated to us. And when we understand that, when we've bathed in that, we're able to give what we have received to others. And when we do that, we give them a glimpse of Jesus. Now follow back. We're back in Luke 23, 35 through 38. Now I'm not going to unpack this because this is the very crux of my next series, the thing that Jesus did. Most significant thing in all of human history changed everything for all of us here, for all of us before us, and all of us after us. And so I'm going to mention a couple things here, but I'm not going to land on it for too long because then I'd give away my series going into Easter. Amen? Here we go. Verse 35, the people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. Here it is. He saved others. Let him save himself. If, if, say it, if, 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 this is God's Messiah. If you're really who you say you are, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. See, there's an incredible degree of irony in this passage, and it's all around verse 35, and here it is. If Jesus had saved himself, it would have come at the expense of humanity. But Jesus endured the cross in order that he would take upon himself what we would never have to endure. Therefore, one gave his life for the saving of the many. Amen? Amen. Oh, we could, all, I mean, we could all go home right now. And that sour wine reference, we kind of wonder what that is. Is that like a mockery that's given to him? No, you got to understand. Sometimes the soldiers, but even in the first century, there were groups of women that were known to visit those being crucified to offer them sour wine. Why? Because it would help to numb 
the pain. Now listen to this. Our Jesus did not want to numb the reality of the pain he was taking upon us, the sin that was inflicted on us, so that we would not have to feel or face or experience the degree of the wrath of God on him that was intended for us, but we never have to experience because of Jesus. He didn't say, I'm going to numb it. He said, I'm going to take it on. And I'm going to do in full for them what they'll never be able to do themselves. But woo, you want to hear some more about that, you've got to come back next week. Moving on. <laughs> Verses 39 through 43. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. No, you want to talk about irony. It, homeboy is nailed to a tree next to him, and he's like, I am going down in a blaze of glory. I'm going to be like the Hindenburg. If I'm going to die, I'm just going to go ahead and just tell everybody what they need to hear in the midst of it. So here he is. This one criminal hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Chosen one. God's anointed. Save yourself and us. There's some selfish motivation. He's like, man, if you can get down, that'd be awesome. Because I'd appreciate if you help a brother out right now. But the other answered, rebuking him. So see the story, Jesus in the middle, these two criminals, one chastising Jesus, the other one rebuking him, saying this, don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. Highlight that, underline that. Did you hear what he said? Do you hear that degree of admission? I am here because I deserve to be there because of the sum total of the things that I've done. I am a guilty criminal and I'm being executed in part. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is one of the most beautiful, sweetest, encouraging passages in all of scripture. And there's two things that we need to pay special attention to. And here it is. What Jesus affirms Okay, here's the first thing. What Jesus affirms, and the second is what the criminal says. What Jesus affirms and what the criminal says. Here's what Jesus affirms first. He says, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Pause for a second. You need to understand this. There is a Greek translation, which the New Testament is written in. There's a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. We're all on track here. That word paradise that's used in Luke 23 in the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Everybody tracking? Good. Is the same word used in Septuagint in Genesis to refer to the Garden of Eden. So what Jesus is telling him is today you're going to be with me and the world made right. Listen to what he's saying. Here, I've got a, a slide up here. What is Jesus saying? The implications of what he's saying. There's a slide. It's going to happen right now. There we go. Here's, here's mm, with. He says you're going to be with who? Jesus. When? Sometime later. Well, no, no, sometime later. I'm not sure. No, when? Today. Where are you going to be? Paradise. Paradise isn't some in-between, intermediary step between earth and heaven. Paradise isn't purgatory. Paradise is creation made right. Paradise is heaven, the way in which God intended back in the Garden of Eden before we sinned and made it all wrong. Follower of Jesus, this should give us a sense of courage and comfort like never before. Because we all think about it, right? We're humans. Because every day that we're alive, we're that much closer to the day that we won't be. And we wonder, like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to me the day that I finally 
breathe my last breath. The day that I close my eyes and I don't open them again, Jesus says, you will be with me. In that moment, in an instant, with the one in whom you've placed your trust, the one who loves you, the one by faith that you have followed, the one who has transformed you, the one who has called you, redeemed you, will also be the one in that moment on that day who welcomes you saying, well done, good and faithful servant. In a moment, And where are you going to be? Are you going to be turned into a chubby little baby with a harp? No, you're going to be in a place of paradise, creation made right. It's hard for us to even fathom, right? I think we all have our own rendition of what paradise is, creation made perfect. Yesterday, my wife and I were in Avila Beach. She had a interior design consultation and and slow. And then we went to the beach and I'm sitting there kind of like ruminating on my message, remember over lunch. And I kind of looked out and I was like, man, this, this is, this is paradise. Like the beauty, the breeze, the feel, the environment, like this is paradise. And in the future, at some point, follower of Jesus, When it is your time and it is done, you will be with him that day in paradise. I should encourage us because we realize James, the brother of Jesus, tells us this life that we work so hard for, we worry about, is a mist. It comes and goes. But Jesus says, I want you to have life and have it to the full right now. And that's only found in him. But in the future, there is something much greater. And let me speak to people who have lost loved ones who are followers of Jesus, and you wonder, what what happened? Like you were in the room with them. You were flooded by a bunch of memories of the days that you experienced together and the things that you did and the places that you went, and you could still hear the ring of their voice and the sound of their laughter, and, and, and you wonder, what happened? Well, that laughter continued, and the sound of that voice went on, because in that moment in which they breathed their last, they were in the presence of Jesus. They were experiencing paradise. No more of the pain or the loss or the suffering or the agony that you experienced or family experienced. But that causes us to ask a question. What in the world did this criminal do to have such certainty of his future? What happened in that moment? He didn't have a chance to jump down from that cross and do a whole bunch of good works to make up for all the bad things that he had done, right? He didn't have a whole litany of prayers to get it right. He didn't have a whole lifetime to redo in order that he could prove his worth to God, right? No, this is what we understand. To gain the fullness of Jesus' love is through admission and confession. That's it. Anything else is not the gospel. You want to see me get all fired up. Anybody tell you that you've got to do this and say this and act a certain way and get all these things right. Check off this list before Jesus accepts you. We see this criminal and through admission and confession, he is guaranteed presence with Jesus that day in paradise. Admission? Admission of what? That he was guilty. That's it. Admission that he deserved the judgment that was coming him. Admission that he had not lived to the high bar of perfection that only one did and his name was Jesus. Admission that he had not gotten it right. Admission that he belonged exactly where he was. And what was his confession? Jesus is innocent. He is the perfect one. And he understood who Jesus was for what Jesus had said, that he understood that there was a kingdom coming. He understood that there was a new day dawning. He understood that Jesus was breaking into space and time and human history to begin to put all things right that were wrong. And he says, Jesus, remember me. How do we get right with Jesus? Admission, confession. We see that Jesus loved the nameless and the numberless. 
and he offers them forgiveness. We understand that, that Jesus loved the guilty and offered them life with him and paradise. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus loves you. You, you may have heard so many renditions of what it looks like to believe in Jesus or, or put your faith in Jesus or you know, respond to the gospel. But the question is, like, you may have seen or, or believed that Jesus could love other people, but maybe that he can never love you. So my question for you today is this. Have you received Jesus' love? He offers it to you, to you. Those of you watching online, to you. Not to somebody else, not to that really bad relative. You're like, ooh, they need Jesus' love. No, if, if you've never received it, he offers it to you. And what does he require? Your admission of guilt. Like, Lord, I, I know the standard is perfection and my life resume declares that I am far from perfect. But you are the perfect one. That's confession. You are the one who, who offers me your life in exchange for mine. And what do we get in exchange? We get to begin to understand the fullness of life now, the significance and the purpose that we have now, but yet hope for the future. Hope to be with Jesus. Hope to experience paradise for eternity. And so what I want to do right now is if you have never had the opportunity or if you've never accepted or received Jesus' love, do not leave this room today without admission and confession. So I'm going to ask us to do a thing right now. If you, you don't have to go anywhere. You really don't have to do anything. Just close your eyes for a second. And if you realize, like, you mean all I got to do is receive Jesus' love? And he calls me a son or he calls me a daughter and, and he gives me life. If, if that's you and you've never received Jesus' love, would you just put your hand up? Because I want to pray for you. Today could be the most significant day in your life that changes everything else. The day that you said yes to Jesus. The day that you admitted that in light of a perfect God, you are imperfect. But Jesus lived a perfect life and offers it to you. And so, Lord, I pray that you know the hearts and the intentions of us because you created us. For those who have had a hard time ever even considering the ability to receive your love, that today they would receive it open-handed, realizing that there is nothing they can do to earn it. There's no way in which they deserve it. But through confession and admission, they can simply receive it. Lord, thank you that you loved us before we got it right. Thank you that you loved us when we were your enemy. Thank you that you loved us when we were guilty as charged and due a penalty. But yet you took that upon yourself so we wouldn't have to. In Jesus' name, amen.